Ryan, I think we ran out of all the great words to say about Zach because he's really gone beyond that because of how successful he's been. So we're going to sit back and watch and see what his command is like today. Then we'll think, think of something to say later. Maybe he'll provide a word for us. <laughs> When the Royals were in Chicago to begin the season, Dwayne Wise was leading off and playing in center field. But he was 0 for 10 with four strikeouts and almost booed out of the city. It's 0 and 2 on Chris Getz. So since then, Ozzie Guillen has been trying to find somebody to bat lead off, get on base. He wants to have more of a balanced offense this year. The White Sox hit a lot of home runs. In fact, they led the league last season, but that was about it. One and two on Chris Getz. Last year got his first major league hit against the Royals. Well, Ozzy really likes Chris Getz. He said to watch him play, you don't think he's, he's going to be that great looking ball player when you just see him on the field, but when, when you put all the intangibles together, then he's just a solid ball player. Good numbers. He's hitting 333. Tough guy to strike out. Good contact hitter. Still two and two. When the White Sox won the World Series in 2005, they had just acquired Scott Podsednik in a trade from the Milwaukee Brewers, and he really turned that lineup around and the offense around. I've got a chunk of Miguel Olivo. Well, he was like the leadoff guy. He was the guy that got things going for him. I talked to Adi about that uh, before the game tonight, and he was saying having him back in the outfield adds a, a different element of speed to go along with Nix and and, Lott and uh, Lillibridge in center field. And so he, he kind of it went from the White Sox, who didn't have a lot of running speed, to now they've got a more versatile team on the field. Base umpire is Todd Tishner. So Zach opens the game with his 45th strikeout of the year. Well, this is Zach's signature pitch with two strikes to a left handed hard curveball off the back leg, and they get a lot of check swings there. And defensively for the Royals, De Jesus, Chris, Guillen in the outfield. On the infield, Tian, Avilas, Kayaspo, Billy Butler back at first. And behind the plate, Miguel Olivo, who has caught all five of Zach's five victories. At the knees over the outside corner to Jason Nix. He was not with the White Sox when these two teams played back in April. Now, coming out of spring training, Ryan, Ozzy felt that Jason Nix really made their ball club, but because of an injury, uh, he wasn't able to leave spring training with the club, so they're really excited to have him back on the ball club. Two balls, one strike. He is the younger brother of Lance Nix. He played for a while with the Rangers and the Milwaukee Brewers. Two and two. I managed against him uh, in 06. He was uh, the second baseman with Colorado and then Tulsa. That was my first chance. I had a chance to see him. Uh, two years I got a chance to see him. So he's he's really come a long way. He was strictly a second baseman back then. First round draft pick of the Rockies in 2001. On the ground to Tien. Two up, two down in the top of the first inning. And let's welcome in Joel Goldberg. Well, guys, got a couple interesting scouting reports today. One from Ozzy Guillen, who walked out and said, this was always one of my favorite parks, but wow, this is now my favorite. He loves it. The other report was from his son, Ozzy Guillen Jr., who says he faced Zach Greinke in high school. He's a year or two younger than him. I said, how'd you do against him? He said, I struck out every single time. He looks right now exactly like he did then. I would remember if I got a hit, but I did not, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks, Joel. And now facing Carlos Quinton, who has eight home runs this year. When Zach faced the White Sox and beat them, 
back on April the 8th with six shutout innings. He hit Carlos Quinton in the game, and Quinton didn't seem to be very happy about that. That's off the fist, and Avilas at shortstop. Makes the play. Zach gets the White Sox 1-2-3 in the first inning. Ian. Ian back in right field. He was the designated hitter yesterday and had that big three run home run. Butler Jacobs, Kayaspo, Olivo, and Avilas back in the lineup. Willie Bloomquist played it short yesterday. And the Royals facing 35 year old Bartolo Colon, who's had great success against the Royals in his career. Former teammate of Coco Crisp with the Cleveland Indians and throw strike one. When you think back to when Bartolo was playing with the Cleveland Indians and what a power fastball he had. I mean, he didn't just come out there and just throw nothing but fastballs. Ripped to Canerco at first and two pitches, one out. Here's the White Sox defense. With Quentin, Lillibridge, and Podsetnik in the outfield. Nick's Ramirez gets Canerco. And veteran catcher A.J. Pierzynski. The league has stolen 17 bases against him. Last year he threw out just 18% of runners. Fastball from Cologne coming in at 89 miles an hour. So as we talked about at the top of the broadcast, not the same pitcher he once was. But what I do remember about him with Cleveland is that he seemed to get stronger as the game went along. Well, that's true. And he's probably 86 to 91 on his fastball. But the one thing that used to be power fastball, power slider, now he's gone more to the curveball, the changeup, uh, and, the, and the soft slider. So, But I think his out pitch is really that r good running fastball about 91 miles an hour he can get to especially in a strikeout situation. Quinton into foul ground. Nice play. Sliding right before he went up against the barrier wall. an outstanding play right here Ryan a lot of outfielders be trying to feel for the wall and they'll shy away but he really knew where it was and he went into a nice little pop-up slide there and kept his eye on the ball and made a nice play so two quick outs for Cologne bringing up Mark Tien Tien just one for seven in Minnesota he scored twice. 
Royals coming up with 24 runs in the three games. Two and one. Great night to be at the ballpark. Very comfortable. Fourth of May, 68 degrees. We started at 711. And the time and temp presented by the parking spot. Easy to spot, easy to park. The parking spot at KCI. And a nice crowd. Still settling into their seats on a Monday night. Tonight is a royal night where you can get $5 tickets. Royals are playing well. Zach Grinke's on the mound, and a lot of folks coming out to watch the Royals. Good late movement. Down goes Tian and Cologne, just like Grinke has a 1-2-3 first. Toyota dealers and where Zach ranks among major league pitchers first in ERA wins and complete games only Arizona's Dan Heron and Detroit's Justin Verlander have more strikeouts on his batting average of just 241 and going for his sixth win tonight. Tomey hits one very high to center field. Coco was playing deep and one pitch one out in the second inning. This week on Fox Saturday Baseball Evan Longoria and the Rays head to Fenway Park to take on David Ortiz and the Red Sox. And what has become a, a great rivalry in the American League East. Fox Saturday Baseball returns this week at a special time of 2 30 following this week in baseball, which is on at 2 o'clock on Fox. Now Paul Canerco. White Sox batting orders had all kinds of problems this year. A lot of nagging injuries. A couple of guys going on the disabled list. Mentioned the issues that they have at the top of the order, but the one guy who's been consistent all season long has been Paul Canerco, who's hitting 310 with 18 RBIs. They got up to a slow start last year, but he was a power right-handed bat that they really needed to come around this year, and and he is a, he's a veteran hitter, loves the ball middle end, and can really still turn on that ball, especially when it's down middle end. You know, not having Jermaine Dye in the lineup uh, really hurts. And Fields is out of the lineup. Both hit on the back of their hands with pitches in the games. And uh, Jermaine is questionable whether he'll be available late. But uh, talking to Greg Walker, their uh, hitting coach, said there is a possibility. There's Jermaine with some padding on the back of his left hand. 
hit on Saturday night. And Canerco, you saw the numbers before that pitch. 128 batting average against Grinky, and now dropping as Zach strikes out a second, and he's retired the first five. But well, Zach's slider is just off the charts when he when he just his arm speed on the fastball and on that hard slider looked the same to a hitter. And by the time they realize that it's not a fastball, they've already committed themselves, and he gets a lot of check swing strikes. So two down for AJ Pierzynski, who heard some boos as he was announced. One ball, one strike. Zach gave up just three hits and struck out seven. He's got two tonight. The three hits, seven strikeouts, no runs when he faced the White Sox back on April the 8th on a cold night in Chicago. He's ahead of Pierzynski, one and two. That was his first ever win at U.S. Cellular Field. That had been a haunted house of sorts for him. He was 0 and 6 with an enormous ERA in Chicago. 8.91. I still remember the game last year where they all came out hitting the first pitch fastball and it's almost like he got on this, on this roller coaster and he couldn't get off of it. And <laughs> I think Jeff Tomey came up and hit the first pitch. But I think the difference now is that he's got a lot of late movement to his fastball. Three and two on Pierzynski. Pierzynski's always been a tough guy to walk. And this year is no different. 74 plate appearances, three walks. Got him with a breaking ball. Six up, six down, three strikeouts. Think about that pitch, they know it's coming. But he can't hit it. Royals and White Sox. Strike one on Jose Guillen. Grinky's retired the first six. Cologne got his first three. And now Guillen, who had six RBIs in the Minnesota series. A big three run home run in the top of the seventh inning. Turning that game completely around. No hit for six innings, and then the first five reached and scored in the top of the seventh. And Scott Baker, I'm sure, is still trying to figure out what hit him. 
hard hit up the middle. There's the Royals' first base runner, and Guillen coming in at 289. Continues to climb towards 300. Of course, he always warms up just like the weather. Well, yeah, and he, he stays short too, Ryan, on, on his uh, on his swing. He doesn't try to overswing and on this pitch. He goes right with the pitch and hits it right back through the middle. Time for You Call It, presented by Sprint. We're going to throw out some possible nicknames for Zach Grinke. Grinkinator, he has his own symbol now for a strikeout. Ball one on Billy Butler, so you make the call. Z Ace, Planet Z, Grinkinator, Zach Tastic. 4343, enter keyword Royals, followed by your selection A, B, C, or D. What happened to Zach Attack? That was. <laughs> one of our options. I guess it was it was vetoed at the last moment. What about plain old Zach? <laughs> <laughs> you know, his his full name is Donald Zachary Grinky. So Zach is actually his middle name, and he went by Donald up until he went to elementary school, and he was okay with that until some of the kids and one of his teachers started calling him Donnie. <laughs> he did not like Donnie. And so on his own, and Zach will do this from time to time. Decided to go down his own course and all of a sudden became Zach. Guys, he probably, you know, just said, all right, I'll hit a home run off you. Stop calling me Donnie. I'll, I'll be Zach. I like what Marlon Bird told me a few weeks ago describing Zach. It wasn't a nickname, but he said he's on, he's in Granky land right now. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know, but he's in Granky land. We, we always say Zach being Zach, but he's in Granky land. Well, that's a good place to be. And how about Jim Tomey comparing him the way he's pitching now, at least, to having the same type of stuff as a Pedro Martinez or a Roger Clemens? Yeah, and I asked him about that before the game. He said, obviously, he's got to sustain it over the years, but his stuff looks like those guys, especially with that 95, 96-mile-an-hour fastball. And, you know, I asked Jim Tomey as well about, well, what do you do against a guy like this? And he said, you, you have to pitch well against him, you have to field well against him, and just hope and wait for a mistake and if he makes that mistake you've got to capitalize on it it certainly looked like Tommy was trying to do that in the first inning didn't have success just got underneath it and flied out to deep center field here's a three and two to Butler and Billy fouls it back into the netting Billy got his first major league hit against Bartolo Colon when he was called up almost exactly two years ago in May of 2007 Cologne was pitching for the Angels, and Billy remembers it was on the third pitch of the at-bat, and he hit a ground ball in between third and short and into left field. Still three and two. Billy just one for 10 in Minnesota. With a run scored, one RBI, but that was a big RBI, which tied the game for the Royals one of the many times they tied the game in that crazy Saturday game called third strike Tom Hallion the home plate umpire who well he does this on a called third strike well we talked about Cologne and his two seamer how he likes to make it back door uh, into the lefties, but the right is he make it back door and catch the outside corner. Billy kind of gave up on it and it came back, and that was strike three. It was interesting that Ryan uh, on a 3 2 count, Jose Guillen wasn't running. It, uh, it went through three about three pitches he wasn't running on, so uh, maybe uh, Trey trying to preserve his legs and make sure that he doesn't do any unnecessary running and, and try to keep him as healthy as possible. Jacob beats the shift. Guillen will stop at second base. The White Sox had Getz way over to the right. If he's at his normal depth in alignment, Jacobs hits it right to him. Well, that's really an overshift right there. The pitcher's really gets it, had to pitch into that. And you can see where the shortstop Ramirez is. And that's a big gap. And, you know, all the ground balls that Jacobs has hit, they usually been in that in that area right there. I haven't seen him hit a lot of ground balls in the, in the pull hole.
So first and second one out for one of the hottest hitters in the American League, Alberto Cayaspo. As Frank calls him, the doubles machine. Well, left-handed, dude. He gets in trouble left-handed when the, when the uh, pitcher throws that two seam and that's running away, and he tries to roll over and try to hook it. But if he stays with it like he did yesterday and hit the ball down the left center field, he'll be more productive. And trying to go towards left field, fouls it away. Diaspo, five hits in Minnesota, four were doubles. And now he has seven doubles in his last five games. He scored five times against the Twins. Again, trying to stay back and go to the opposite field. It's one and two. You can see Przezinski on that pitch. He got way over behind the back leg of Kaspo as if he was looking for a pitch inside. Then he slid back to the outside just in case. Uh, Kaspo was sneaking a peek back there to see where he was. There's a bird just kind of hanging out in between the mound and home plate. Now on your screen, it looked like the bird was about to land on Cologne's shoulder, but he actually was hovering in between home plate and the pitcher's mound. It's that time of year when the spring birds start arriving at Coffin Stadium. Into right field, another hit for Kiasco, and now the ball kicked around in right field by Podsednik. And two runners will advance another base. One to nothing Royals. Well, Kiasco continues to hit. He was pitched away, 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 and uh, Cologne tried to sneak the fastball on the inner half, and he was sitting there waiting on it and hit a line drive to right field. Podsednik had a tough time with it. And Ginn was able to continue after Posad Posadnik dropped the ball. Then uh, Dave had already held him up. Again, obviously, in the run and really up to par uh, at this point. No RBI. Ginn scoring on the air. Jacobs going to third on the air. And now a strike on Miguel Olivo. And you could tell Miguel wanted to look at a pitch there because. They've been just junking him to death on the first pitch. And the time that he decides to look at one, Cologne just lays one in there for him. That happens all the time. When you're, when you're not swinging the bat well, that happens to you all the time. You try to be patient. You try to get in a hitting count, but they won't let you get there. So he really has to work hard this at bat. And now he's down. No balls and two strikes. Three hits, three RBIs in Minnesota. He had a, a big two out, two strike two run triple off the baggie on Saturday night against Glenn Perkins another one of those comebacks in the middle of Saturday night just missed the outside and one of the things that I would do with myself whenever I got in a rut at the plate I would always put a hit and run on it when the manager gave me a hit and run I thought that was a great thing for me because it made me cut my swing down, made me watch the ball a little longer, and try to hit the ball back through the middle. Jacobs at third, Kiaspo at first. And there's the pitch that gives Olivo trouble. Malone comes up with a big strikeout, his third, and two down. Budweiser tells us what's on tap. This is a very short homestand. Two games against the White Sox and then former Royal Mike Sweeney and the Seattle Mariners will be here on Wednesday night, Thursday afternoon. Then the Royals head to the West Coast. They'll play three in Anaheim against the Angels. They'll be in Anaheim to play Los Angeles. And then two games in Oakland. Ball one to Mike Avilas. Three out of eight in Minnesota with a run scored, facing Bartolo Colon for the first time. Now this is where the Royals 
have been kind of picking themselves up on offense. Runner at third base, less than two outs, strikeout, pop up, don't get the runner home, but the Royals have been so clutch lately coming up with hits with two outs. Well, it's really made those situational things that they weren't doing well even, even pay off because they were getting those two big two out hits. Milos really tied up. Yeah, and the count goes to one and two. Yeah, David De Zeus helped them with one. Uh, Jose Guillen helped them with another. So these are, I, when you listen to the guys talk after the game, you listen to Jacobs, you listen to Jose Guillen, that's the one thing that they really have been sort of saying a lot of is that we're starting to pick each other up now. Even though some may not work for one guy, the next guy seems to come up and get it done. So that in itself can be contagious. That's well, exactly where Pierzynski wanted it, thinking that Avilas would chase. It's two and two. A run home on an air in right field by Scott Podsednik. And Avilas laying off a couple of close pitches, and the count goes from one and two to three and two. And Hiaspo at first base will break early. Well, if they fake the third and come back to first, <laughs> that'd be too early. <laughs> That's out of play. You know, when you talk about deceiving a runner, I think that play right there deceives the runner. When you go to first base, you got to break contact with the rubber to go to first. But when you use that play, you don't break contact until you come back to first. You can actually have contact with the rubber when you when you throw the ball to third base or fake the third base. So I think if you use that play, I think the pitcher should be made to throw the ball somewhere, whether it be third base or first base, just like the inside move to second base to try to deceive the runner. I think if you're going to use that move, you have to throw the ball. I like that idea. Called third strike. The Royals get just one, an unearned run against Cologne in the second inning. Dennis Hurla, who has led the Bishop Ward High School baseball team to six straight Kansas 4A state championship titles, earning the honor of being named the 2008 Coach of the Year by the American Baseball Coaches Association. Lives in Edwardsville, Kansas, the only coach from Cam Kansas to ever receive that award. And by the way, our own Nate Bucati played baseball at Bishop Ward, but had already graduated before Coach Hurla started his run of state championships. Alexi Ramirez has done that before. You have to be some kind of flexible to be able to fall back the way he just did. Well, this fastball just really ran up and in, and he did he did what he was supposed oh. to do. <laughs> he did exactly what he was supposed to do. Get out of the way. 
But you don't usually see the catcher reach down and give him a hand and help him up. <laughs> Two and one. Now that's pretty much unfair right there. You really go up under his neck like that and put him on his back and then drop that soft curveball on the outside corner. That's two extremes right there. Two and two. Zach has retired the first six with three strikeouts. Four strikeouts. So the fans that came out here tonight are getting what they were hoping to see. Well, that pitch up and in really made a big difference in this at bat. The Ramirez is really a, a free swinger, and that, that pitch really just took him out of his game. But Sednik hits it hard, and it's off of Piasco's glove. That's going to be ruled a base hit. Looked like a play that Kiaspo could have made, but Maybe he was a little unsure. He didn't look real comfortable leaning over for that ball. Well, a lot of times when you get a ball like that as a as a as an infielder, you don't know whether the ball is on the ground or just above the ground, and he may have just tried to get it too much toward the end of his glove. And a lot of time when a left-hander hits it, it moves. It's kind of slicing away. So he might have thought it was in one spot, and you only get one shot at a ball like that. Sometimes they hit a knuckleball at you too, right? And it can have a little. Just like a, a hitter dealing with a pitcher that has late movement, the ball can have some late movement. It, it definitely can. So you really need to know exactly where it's at. So you only get one shot. And so it looked like the ball might have went down, and it looked like the ball just sort of went down on him. Now ball one on Brent Lillibridge. Well, if Zach isn't going to throw a no hitter. As we learned yesterday, you might as well give it up in the second inning or the third inning <laughs> rather than wait until the seventh like Scott Baker did. And then he didn't know what to do. Well, he, he got on something that he couldn't get out of. And it was a, it just amazing. Pod said and it got a huge jump. But look at that throw. Not even close to get Scott put Sednik two down. Well, Miguel Oliva, that's his strength right there, is catching and throwing, and, and he is so quick. You know, normally you, you try to keep a catcher under two, two, two seconds. He was like 1.75 on that catch and release, and that, that's, that's, that's about as good as it gets right there. But Sednik spun his wheels a little bit, but he got a, an early break off of Zach. Now Butler over near the tarp with Kiaspo, and Billy makes the play. The White Sox get their first hit, but Zach has faced the minimum through three.
Motors. To learn more, visit Kia.com. And by Colorado Tourism. Plan your summer vacation at Colorado.com. One to nothing Royals to the bottom of the third inning. And the top of the order to face Martola Colon. Coco rounded out sharply to Canerco at first base in the first inning, 0 for 1. Coco, only three hits in Minnesota, but did his thing in center field and made an outstanding play in the game yesterday. One ball, two strikes. He is at odds with home plate umpire Tom Hallion. You know, the play he made, he was pretty lucky he was in the Metrodome when he made that play because he, the bag he did give when he hit it, hit it with his back out of control like that. Had it been this day, then he might have had some injury that would still be butt bugging him today. And strikes out. That is Cologne's fifth already. Here's the Roadrunner turbo speed pitch comparison so far. Brinkies hit 97, Cologne 93. So upper 80s, right around 90 in first two innings, starting to climb in the miles per hour. Double your speed with Roadrunner Turbo from Time Warner Cable. That 97 used to be Cologne's working range. That was <laughs> that was his comfort zone right there at 96, 97. De Jesus fouled out to left fielder Carlos Quinton in the first inning. David looking more like David after the Minnesota series. Five hits, four RBIs. Down in the count, no balls, two strikes. Belted to deep right field. Podsednik back and to Jesus with his third home run of the year. Pitchers, when you miss your spot, Krasinski was looking for a fastball up away, and Cologne left that ball in and, and middle. And David DeJesus got a good turn on it and a line drive in, in the right field bullpen. Ball one on 10. You see where Krasinski's asking for this ball, and you see where it was. So he missed by a lot with this pitch, and David made him pay. Tian beats the ship like Jacobs did in the second inning and has a one out single. He's one for two. Now, Frank, in my opinion, and coming from someone who never came close to playing in the major leagues, I think the difference between major league hitters and guys who don't quite make it maybe is not necessarily, you know, their ability to hit the ball, but it seems like the good major league hitters, it doesn't matter what the count is. They are always ready for their pitch. You're always ready for that fastball for sure. And, and when it's in your wheelhouse, if you're strong middle in, it doesn't matter whether it's 0-2 or 1-2, you're going to get a good swing on it. If, if, if Colon gets that ball up and away, it might be a different at bat. But hitters hit pitchers' mistakes. Now, I'm really surprised that they had such a shift on, on Mark there, uh, so much to pull. Colon is throwing a two-seamer going away from lefties. and. And if they try to pull it, it's probably going to be more straight up second base than the pull hole. And we've seen a couple balls already get through there. See, this is a surprise shift to me because the, where you see the, the light spot to the right, that, that's probably where it gets all to be when they, when they throw in that, uh, that two-seamer because it's going down and away. You know who had him played perfectly was second base umpire Phil Cuzzy. <laughs> so 
See the umpire right there? Just to the right of second base. That's a routine play for him. <laughs> Again, had a good rip. It's one ball, two strikes. Singled, leading off the second inning, and then scored when Podsednik kicked the ball around in right field. Well, this situation here with two strikes, this is where the Rawls right-handed hitters have been getting in trouble. Colon is throwing a two-seamer to the outside, trying to make it still the outside corner, and the right-handed hitters are giving up on it. So Gian really needs to stay with this pitch if he throws it right here and try to take it the other way. Two and two. Well, that's what he did against Baker when he hit the three-run home run yesterday, down in the count, looking for a pitch away, and... Drove it to right center field. Well, as a hitter, it's nothing prettier than hitting a three-run homer, especially when it ties the game or puts you ahead. I mean, I, you got all. I think I think that is probably the thrill of being a hitter next to a grand slam is that that three-run homer when the game's on the line. Just missed outside, but Cologne hoping to get Ian the same way he got Mike Avila's to win the second inning. You give up on that pitch too soon, and then it tails over the edge. It comes back and gets to the outside corner. It's a 3-2 count now. So we can expect Mark to be running right here. He's off. And it's bounced to third. Nick's throw is low, but Canerco with good hands. So Guillen is out, two down. Keeping an eye on the American League Central Division, Detroit, a half game behind the Royals. Minnesota's in town, and this is Michael Kadire at the top of the seventh inning. Hitting a two-run triple over the head of Curtis Granderson. And Minnesota's out to a four-to-one lead. Here are the standings coming in tonight. Tigers a half game back, the White Sox a game and a half, followed by Minnesota and Cleveland, who are below 500. I would be shocked if Billy Butler takes a called third strike in this plate appearance. <laughs> well, he just needs to keep it together, you know, especially when he gets the two strikes and, and, and still make sure it's a good pitch and don't just uh, swing because he doesn't want to put it in the hands of the umpire. Cologne jumps ahead, nothing in two. So this is where Cologne is at his best when he when he's ahead in the count. Uh, again, he ran the, the two seamer up and in, and then he went back to the outside to try to steal the outside corner. He made a big mistake 0-2 to David, so let I don't think he wants to make it <laughs> a big mistake here 0-2 to Butler. ball two strikes it was a borderline called third strike Billy thought it was a little bit high into left center field and the Royals are going to have a three to nothing lead. So another Royal down in the count. One ball, two strikes on Butler. He drives in his 10th of the year. Again, Cologne missed his spot again. He wanted a two seamer to run up and, and in on Billy. It stayed down out over the plate. And that's a great spot for a right-handed hitter. That ball down in the middle, it's just like a golf shot. Just throw your hands and, and get to the ball, and the ball will really jump for you. And the White Sox back to that same shift for Mike Jacobs, who singled into right center field. And that's hammered into deep right. Podsednik can't make the play. Let's see how far Butler will go. Dave Owen's going to hold him. So Jacobs two for two. And now two in scoring position for Kiaspo. 
Well, what Jacobs, he, he always likes the ball down the middle, and Cologne throws a changeup right out over the plate, and he really gets the head of the bat on this ball. Well, suddenly, look, he had a hard time picking it up. He, he broke, and he kind of hesitated, then he realized it was over his head. And Billy running all the way with an opportunity to score. He got his head down, and he's really chugging along with it. But he had to put the brakes on to stay there at third base. So second and third for Kiaspo, who singled in the second inning. Bartolo Colon did not get off to a very good start for the White Sox. His ERA was over six after his first three, but. In his last start, he allowed just one unearned run in seven innings, and now the White Sox are going to put Kiaspo on. So we've gone from in a little over a month wondering if Alberto Kiaspo was going to make the team to now he's getting intentionally walked in the third inning. Well, he was one of those guys that everybody was wondering if he's had any playing time at all, and if so, where it was going to be, and and this kind of interesting how sometimes an injury can force a guy into a situation where you can say hey we really uh, maybe maybe underestimate this guy well here are some of the reasons why the White Sox walked him he also singled in his first at bat all the doubles batting average is now up near 390 and he has a six game hitting streak and his walk means Butler's at third Jacobs at second and Kiaspo at first for Miguel Olivo. Olivo struck out swinging in the second inning and you know he's fired up. White Sox walking Kiaspo to get to him. Now this is a situation where the Royals have had some problems this year. Now they have been an excellent team lately hitting with two outs but they're 0 for 8 with the bases loaded in two outs and 100 overall batting average with the bases loaded period and that kind of goes back Ryan to what, what we talked about early and we talked about it often is the, the hitter taking the pressure and taking the pressure off the pitcher and putting it on himself and and not being very selective in the pitch that he's trying to hit in this situation. Now that hard breaking ball has been a, a, a really a tough pitch for Olivo uh, all year. So he, he's got to learn how to take that pitch and recognize it a lot quicker out of the pitcher's hand. And he is literally battling a personal demon here. Miguel with his strikeout in the second inning is now 0 for 7 with four strikeouts against Cologne. Kevin Seitzer. Trying to yell some last second words of encouragement. Now, Levo has come through a few times this year down in the count, shortening up his swing. One ball, two strikes. I think he's even surprised himself a couple times when he drove those balls into right center field, the home run to right center field, the, the triple off the baggie in Minneapolis. I mean, if he could just hold it right there and make himself concentrate more in that area, it really would benefit him a lot more as a hitter. the corner so the Royals lead the bases loaded but they add two runs David de Jesus with one out belting his third home run of the year and Billy Butler follows with an RBI single
Uh, he, he's been trying to pound and establish his fastball this first time around, and I can I can see him going to maybe more off speed the first pitch, and then trying to finish off with the hard slider like he usually does. Zach retired the first seven before the Podsednik one out single in the third. Chris Getz batting now struck out swinging. Four strikeouts. Zach has faced the minimum after the Podsednik single. He was caught stealing by Olivo. Two and one. Two balls, two strikes. Thing about Zach, though, Frank, is that unlike other pitchers, where it seems to get easier the deeper they go, it gets worse. It gets way worse the deeper you get into the game. Well, I think that's because he's been able to really recognize when I when he needs to make a change. Uh, last year he stayed primarily fastball, and now he's he's able to get his other three pitches over the plate on first pitch and. In a strikeout situation, I think that re that's really what helps him, and that's what really makes him what who he is, because he puts hitters in a two-strike approach all the time when you when you be able to get those many pitches over. Butler makes the play to Zach, one down. You, know, you mentioned yesterday when Billy came in for defense uh, late yesterday, how far. Billy Butler has come and he, he's, he's been making great plays all year and he's looked very relaxed over there and so Trey Hillman had no problem putting him in for defense but he did a great job right there not only just catching the ball but you see right here he stayed soft he went through the ball and regained his footing and gave Zach a nice feed. And now curveball for a strike on Jason Nix. Billy brought up a good point the other day I was talking to him about his defense and he said what's really helped him is that all the ground balls, all the innings at first base, that he is feeling more comfortable there. And that's the obvious part of the story. But he said now that he's feeling comfortable and he's not worried about where the ball goes or his footwork, now he can start anticipating. He can start thinking about scouting reports. He can start playing out different scenarios before the ball is even put in play so that when the ball comes to him, there really isn't any kind of a – you know, on the spot decision to make, he already has it played out. And that's what all good infielders and players should do. They should pre think the situation before every pitch so they can react to it so they don't have to catch the ball and say, okay, what do I do with it? You don't have that much time. Two balls, two strikes. Jason Nix grounded out to third in the first inning. I really like the fact that they've taken Billy and moved him over into the base hit hole, and that way he don't have to worry about going to his left and going to the bag. So That's number five for Zach. Two down in the fourth inning. Well, Zach has really got it going with his slider right here. He's been able to get his fastball over, and this hard slider has been the pitch of the day in strikeout situations. And this is one of those pitches, Ryan, where the hitters probably know this pitch is coming, but Zach is not making any mistakes with it. It's either going to be right on the corner or just off the corner, and it's going down. And I think his arm speed and the pitch recognition out of the hand is, is difficult for the hitter to pick up, whether it's a slider or a fastball. Many fans are in the spirit tonight. There are K's, or in this case, Z's, all over the place. It's 0-2 on Quinton. Fox Sports Kansas City is now on Facebook and Twitter. On Facebook, you'll see Royals videos and behind-the-scenes photos. And on Twitter, unique Royals news and analysis during the game. Go to foxsports.com slash Kansas City. He went around another 1-2-3 inning, and Grinke has struck out six in four innings tonight.
Royals baseball brought to you tonight by Corona Beer. This Cinco de Mayo, be sure to grab some ice-cold Corona or Corona Light. The perfect holiday for Mexico's favorite beer. Relax responsibly. And by AT&T, switch to the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. 3 to nothing, Royals. Zach Grinke working on another gem. It's 2-0 and on Mike Avilas. Struck out his first time against Bartolo Colon. And the count is now 3-0. and The Royals' first run coming in the second on an error in right field by Podsednik. And then DeJesus homered. Butler singled, both driving in runs in the third. Balls, two strikes. Well, Cologne has actually thrown the ball pretty well. He made two mistakes. One, he missed, it, missed his location on David on the home run and, and also missed his location on Billy on the base hit RBI. You just witnessed the extent of Bartolo Cologne's range as he throws out Mike Avilas. One down in the fourth inning. Well, fans, if you haven't heard yet, you need to know about the new weekday play pack. It's a great deal for weekday games in May. Four field plaza tickets for $20 worth of concessions and unlimited free games in the outfield for just $40. It's a $150 value. Ball one on Coco. He has grounded out sharply to first and struck out. Shallow center and Brent Lillibridge makes the play. Two down in the fourth inning. Let's update you call it presented by Sprint. You have a favorite Zach Brinke nickname. Hey, it's close. Zach Tastic. 35%. I like Zach Attack, and that was on the original list, but I don't like any of them. You don't? No. Yeah, it sounds so cartoonish, you know. Brinkinator is hard to say. That's a mouthful. Well, maybe we could do something like uh Sorius, there's a guy who made the Grinkinator sign. He didn't use all of Zach's head, however, just most of it. <laughs> he doesn't look anything like that. But Soria is what the executioner? Yes. And uh, Zach is from Florida. He could be the uh, Florida executioner. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're reaching. <laughs> Well, he's getting to a point now, Frank, where he is in this town, and I think soon in baseball will be on a one-name basis. You say Zach in Kansas City, and everyone knows who you're talking about. I think that's the best name. I, I would just leave it right there and not even play around with it. Well, we're not going to try and legally change his name or anything like that. We're just coming up with a nickname. That's a nickname, Zach. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right, with am I, am with I right? Zachary right? being the, the full name. You didn't hear our conversation earlier. That's actually his middle name. His first name is Donald. Don't call me Donnie. Cologne has an impressive one, two, three, fourth inning. He has struck out seven.
Lights and analysis. They're getting the set ready now. Joel's makeup artist is getting ready for the post game show brought to you by Boulevard Brewing Company, Kansas City's beer. Zach Greinke is allowed one base hit, and that was off the glove of Alberto Cayaspo in the third inning. He's faced the minimum because Podsednik, who singled in the third inning, was later caught stealing. Late on the fastball, it's 0-2. Tomey flied out to center in the second inning. Seven strikeouts. Grinky and Cologne have combined for 14 strikeouts, and we're not even halfway through the game. Well, that's a great job of pitching right there between Olivo and Zach. They throw a fastball in in a half, and Tommy swings and misses. And it comes back in a half with that hard slider. And like I said earlier, they don't know whether it's a fastball or a slider until they're halfway through their swing. Paul Canerco struck out swinging in the second inning. Frank, isn't that what makes three and four pitch pitchers so difficult? I mean, just when you think you know what he's using tonight, he pulls out a completely new game plan. A whole new game plan. He started Jim Tomey off with the fastball the first time, came back fastball the first second time. And here, Canerco, the first ball fastball hitter, and he starts him off with a slow curveball first pitch strike. So that's what that's why it's difficult right there because guys aren't maximized in the pitch they want to be maximized in because normally you can you can go to fastball curveball or fastball slider. There may be a change up, but you kind of know what the guy's out pitch is. But with Zach, you have no clue what his out pitch is going to be. James B. Nutter showing us that Zach now has 53 pitches. And, and, and makes him doubly tough too as he's pitching in off the plate. He's got guys jumping around, moving their feet, and he's clearing the lanes that he wants. And, and that, that you throw it inside, and you go back out to where you want the ball. Coco back to the track to get Canerco. Back to Comerica Park in Detroit. Alexi Casilla. Who did nothing against the Royals in that three game series was 0 for 11. He bloops this one into left field, driving in two runs almost at the same time. And Minnesota with a 6 to 1, 6 to 1 lead now in the top of the eighth inning. A.J. Pierzynski struck out swinging in the second inning. Broke his bat, and Kiaspo can't get it. So Krasinski just muscles one out into center field. And now Krasinski, he really tries to get into a lot of players' heads, but in particular, Zach Grinke. I remember last year, he was jawing at Grinke, ended up homering against him. They're both from the Orlando area. Well, a lot, a, lot, a lot of players always have an indifference to A.J. Przenski, but the one thing about him, he does know the game. He knows how to play the game, and he, and he knows how to disrupt the tempo of the pitcher. And even though Zach made a great pitch there and broke his bat, he was still strong enough to get it out into the outfield for a base hit. I remember last year when Przenski was jawing at him, somebody asked Zach about that after the game, and Zach just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, that's what he does. So... There's another guy, as you said, who's indifferent about it. Just goes after the next hitter and gets Ramirez to roll the tee in. And the inning is over.
Cougars have given him a three to nothing lead. Talking with John Buck as he gets ready for the top of the sixth inning. Tian launches it to right, but Sednik is there to make the catch. Tian is one for three. That's something John Buck talked a lot about last year. Now we remember that he didn't have a great year at the plate, but he had made a commitment to himself and the team before the year even began. Didn't matter how he was hitting, didn't matter how much he was playing. His goal every day was to do whatever he could to help the pitcher out. And then that's a good way to be. And I think every player on the team should should have that same goal coming to the ballpark, doing whatever they can to help their team win and, and help whoever's in the game playing that, that, that night to be a better player that particular night. But it really helps a pitcher because now you have both catchers working together uh, with the pitchers to try to come up with the same pitching plan and the same goals. Yen, deep left field. It's hooking. And it is foul. That's one area, Ryan, where they really can't play around with him and right there is down and in because he can pull those hands in and he can get the bat hit to the ball as quick as anyone in that area. Did a little change up coming down inside and he just stayed right where he just tracked it right in there. And I tell you what, we've seen him hit a change up out, out the left field already this year. <laughs> that one that runs back in, that's a dangerous change up to throw to a right hander. Brian Tallett of Toronto. Is that who you're thinking of in the last homestand? One was a changeup, one was a slider. And neither one of them came back. Two and two. I just love your memory. Well, shucks. Thanks, Frank. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I remember the home runs and the pitches, but do you remember the names? <laughs> See, that makes a good team. You remember part of it, I remember the other part. <laughs> Ian now at 298, going one for two tonight. And he is seven for his last 14. Lays off a pitch that was outside. Cologne has been trying to work that pitch to the righties all night. It's his second walk and brings up Billy Butler. Billy took a called third strike in the second inning. But with two outs in the third and down in the count one and two. Singled home Mark Tian for the third run of the game. That was the pitch he was hoping to get. Guillen instead he missed outside for a walk. Well that's his go to pitch when he wants to get a strikeout and and that's the pitch that's going to get the induced ground balls. Right-handed hitter rolls over on it. Ground ball is short. Nix plays a tough hop and loses the opportunity for the double play and only gets Butler. That was a wicked hop that he had to deal with. Well, it got up in uh, into his body, and that's always tough when you, when a when a hop goes in there. You really gotta slow yourself down at that point and just try, try to make sure you can you can get it out somewhere. The ball's got, got top spin on it and just hit and come straight up. Now, Frank, when you guys make plays like that, what amazes me is that a hop like that, you don't really catch it with your glove, right? It's up against your body, but it's almost like you create a funnel with your arm so it just kind of rolls down your arm into the glove, right? Well, as a third baseman, the first baseman, you just want to take it and block it and keep it in front of you and, and make sure you get have an opportunity to get it out someplace. And he, he did everything right after after the ball was bobbled. Jacobs has hit two bullets, a single and a double. His first two hits of the year against the White Sox. He has Guillen in scoring position with two outs. And the Royals have been so good with two outs lately. 
And there's that runner. And it's nothing in two. That's a perfect example of what we talked about on the last home stand, the difference between a sinker and a runner. Yeah, the sinker will go down, and the runner just goes right across the plate, and he, he wants to throw it at the, at, at the midsection and get you to move your feet. And when you when you give up on it, that's when it catches the, uh, out the inside corner to a lefty and the outside corner to a right-hander. Threw it again, a little harder, one and two. Still a ball and two strikes. Jacobs with hits in the second and third innings. Well, he had a nice little, nice little ground ball up the middle for a base hit, and there he got a changeup that he hit for a double over the head of Potsednik in, in right field. Yeah, the pitch that Martello's trying to get inside to Jacobs, if it stays down. But low to thighs, that, that's one that really can, can he can get hurt on. He needs to keep it up to where the hitter will give on it. Usually the lower that pitch goes, the better you see it. And runs it. Trying to get the inside corner, but it's just staying inside on Jacobs and the count from 0 and 2 to 2 and 2. He end with a one out walk, went to second base on Butler's ground out. This next pitch from Cologne will already be his 95th. He didn't get the call again. That one might have been a little high. Although a guy like Jacobs, I don't know if there is a little bit high because his strike zone is a little bit high. <laughs> it looks high when Pierzynski catches it, but where is it in relation to Jacobs' belt? Well, that's true, and he, he's always better with the ball down than the ball up. A lot of times the ball that mid-thigh out over the plate, he can drive it in left center field and have a lot of success that way. Well, Cologne had a goal against Jacobs, and he wasn't going to vary from it. Trying to run it from inside over the inside part of the plate. And that's a good walk for Jacobs, who at one point was down 0-2. And, and that gets us to Kayaspo. That's Clayton Richard warming up as... Cologne is now at 96 pitches. In his first four starts, he only averaged 86 pitches per start, so they're stretching him out a little bit tonight. Of course, it's a nice night, good night to pitch. A single for Kayaspo in the second inning, an intentional walk in the third. Up the left field line, Carlos Quinton runs it down. Royal strand two and lead three to nothing.
world's most refreshing beer. Scott Podsednik leads off. And a curveball for strike one. Podsednik got the first hit for the Sox after Zach retired the first seven. A line drive that just nicked off the glove of Alberto Cayaspo. And didn't mean to, but he got a piece of it. And the count is 0-2. And then Zach went on to retire six in a row after the Podsednik liner when A.J. Pierzynski hit a broken bat bloop into center for the second Chicago hit. Whoa. So Zach is trying to steal the, the inside corner with, with, that, with, his, with this runner, his two-seamer, and he remembered Podsednik hit the line drive, and he started him off with a slow curve strike the first pitch. Two and two. It's amazing how they throw that hard slider. If they throw it away from the hitters, they don't really chase it. When they throw it down and in to the lefties, it looks so good that they can't hold. They can't hold up. Sednick hasn't seen this Zach Greinke because he wasn't with the White Sox in April. Billy can't handle the tough hop, and Podsednik, with excellent speed, will move to second base. That was ruled a double, just in case you're scoring at home. Well, there's certain balls you should try to get in front of, and there's certain balls you should play on the side. And then this ball here with the top spin and going to Billick's left, he probably should just try to play that one with one, with one hand to his left and not try to get in front of that one because he's got off to his right side. So if you, if, if you can't stay with the ball in the middle, then you're better off to just back it, just forehand the ball and, and go to the bag. double. So now Lillibridge fouled out first time and that's a breaking ball for a strike. I don't think it would help Billy Butler to go up to him right now and say Billy don't worry about it. That was ruled a double. <laughs> well uh, infielders really know when they should make a play and when they shouldn't make a play. So it really doesn't matter what the guy put on the board. Uh, they, they burn internally. They want to make all the plays for the pitcher. The thing he's got to do now is just forget about it and get ready for the next one and worry about that one when he gets to the bench. Brent Lillibridge coming over to the White Sox from the Atlanta Braves and the deal that sent Javier Vasquez to Atlanta. A former fourth round draft pick of the Pittsburgh Pirates. A little high. Lillibridge trying to make the team out of spring training as an infielder, but because of injuries to Dwayne Wise, Brian Anderson, and Jerry Owens in the minor leagues, somebody needed to play center field. Zach has struck out his eight. And that leaves Podsednik at second base. Here's, here's that hard, hard slider again, right on the outside corner. The White Sox hitters just can't seem to lay off that pitch tonight. And I think it's because Zach is throwing it with the same arm speed as his fastball, and they're picking it up way too late. Zach has struck out. Now eight or more in four of his five starts. This being his fifth. Struck out seven the last time he faced the White Sox in April. Nine against Cleveland, ten against Texas, ten against Detroit, eight against Toronto. Hit hard to right field, but Guillen is right there. 
two down with Podsednik still at second base. On Saturday, May the 16th, 20,000 fans will receive a replica of the new K thanks to Fox Sports Kansas City. The stadium is part of a four-piece collectible set that will also include three Royals Hall of Fame statues. You can get your tickets at 1-800-6-ROYALS, royals.com, the Kauffman Stadium box offices, or any Ivy food store. So a leadoff double to Podsednik, but he's still standing there, and now Jason Nix, who has grounded out and struck out, and a slow roller to Billy, to Zach. How about that? Getting fancy with the scoop. Even Zach cracked a smile after this play. Well, only Zach can make that adjustment since he's a great athlete. That really helps a lot. If the Royals hit a home run in this inning, Mary will win $2,600. But if the Royals hit a grand slam out of the park, Mary will win twenty-five grand from Sonic and the Kansas City Royals. Missouri's Autobahn, Greenwood, Missouri. Have you ever got a ticket? No, Greenwood? I haven't. I haven't. But I still think it's... <laughs> possible to get a ticket in Greenwood even though the people on the street are walking faster than the cars are driving <laughs> two and one on Miguel Olivo who has struck out twice but that was against Bartolo Colon and now Miguel facing left-hander Clayton Richard Colon going five innings because of 98 pitches Two balls, two strikes. Clayton Richard, a former quarterback at the University of Michigan. They got two former Wolverines in there with second baseman Chris Getz. He was a red shirt his first year and then as a red shirt freshman he threw 15 passes for the Wolverines and then gave up football and by his third year was baseball only but had the thrill of playing at the big house in Ann Arbor Michigan. A 
Olivo up the middle and has a leadoff single in the sixth inning. Miguel seemed to be doing his best work against left handed pitching. He's, he's staying out over the plate. Anything up out over the plate, he's hitting back through the middle, right center field. They'll just take that same approach to the right side, but he didn't try to overswing, just stayed right with him, right with the pitch, and line drive right back through the middle. Well, there were some people yelling balk over on the right side, thinking that Richard deceived the runner, as they say, in his throw over there, trying to see if Avilas might lay down a bunt. Zach might only need three runs tonight. Who knows? But do you at least consider maybe playing for one more run this late in the game? Well, that's a great option. They got the right combination of player at the plate with Avilas, and he's trying to get his bat on track. That be a, he'll be a good guy to do it with in this situation here. It'd also be a good opportunity to hit and run with this combination. Ruled badly, one ball, one strike. We understand there is someone in the ballpark tonight who appreciates food more than he does, <laughs> and Joel has found him. Yeah, you know, I can't eat all the food all the time. I'm with Guy Fieri from the Food Network who just wanted to come and catch a game. How, how big of a baseball fan are you? Oh, man, I'm a big baseball fan. The Royals are doing a good job tonight, aren't they? Been great. Ryan, there he goes. He's excited. It's going to get caught, but Guy's been loving... Guy's been loving watching Zach Granke pitch. They give me a time. I'm always eating food at the ballpark. That's not a bad thing, is it? Not a bad thing at all. It's actually a good thing. All right, so I mean, you travel all over the country. You get to taste food for everybody. And everybody. What do you love about ballpark food? Originality. Just makes it originality. People, people make it themselves. Yeah, I mean, about it too, guys. I, I brought over some barbecue, and you know, nowadays it's not just hot dogs and hamburgers. We, you know, we got the cheesy corn, we got the ribs, we got the burn ends, and that's uh, that, that, that's the way. It, it's not as simple as hot dogs and hamburgers anymore, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. It's quite it's getting more complex as we go. Joel, is that a wristband he's wearing? Uh, that is a wristband. Now, you're pretty serious about your food when no. you need a wristband to eat. He's serious. Well, I don't know. If, he's just serious about baseball and food. And actually, and, and guys known not just for his love of food, but but the hair is sort of a, one of the signatures. AJ Pruszynski of the White Sox, he's got that blonde spiked hair. How you know? <laughs> oh, oh. oh, pickle! Oh. Get him! Oh. Well, leave it to <laughs> leave it to guy to pull out the one food-related baseball term. He screamed out pickle. Well, what else would you expect? He's not going to call it a, a rundown. Yeah. Well, he's done with you, Joel. Well, he's already getting a call about, I, I guess, about the pickle. I don't know. <laughs> well, the fans over on the right side, and maybe even come from the Royals' dugout, thinking that that was a balk move over towards first. He pulled Olivo. Well, you have to have that 25-degree angle, and it it, it it can really deceive the runner with this move here. If you watch his right hip, the right hip kind of goes to home plate, and then he then he goes back over. So that's that's definitely a balk. So. so two down, and now Coco Crisp, who's 0 for three. Two balls and no strikes. It's kind of hard to tell Ryan in that situation there when, when Oliva get, got picked off, whether he was running on his own or whether there was a hit and run on and he left too soon. It's kind of hard to tell. And we also tried to steal home the other night, so he, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it wouldn't have been a pickle if it had been a balk, right? Then you got to come up with another term. Is there a food term for a balk, guys? Guy's okay. phone. Guy's phone is blowing up right now. Sounds like he's really enjoying talking to you, Joel. Well, I'm trying to contend not just with the phone, but a baseball game and cheesy corn. And a guy 
I can't see now. A guy's taking our picture with his cell phone. But that's, you know, that happens. We got ribs and uh, cheesy corn. The good folks out at the uh, barbecue stand who seem to always take care of us. Always take care of me and burn ends. And I'm not sharing any with you guys. Are you a share or no? I'm sorry, what? You share? Never. Yeah. See? Yeah. And this inning finally comes to an end. Three to nothing Royals at the end of six. Reach for the perfect balance of flavor and refreshment. Budweiser, the great American lager. Three to nothing Royals, seventh inning. Zach Greinke has given up two singles and a bad hop double. He'll face Carlos Quinton, Jim Tomey, and Paul Canerco. Zach is in excellent shape in regard to pitch count. That is just his 71st pitch. And if he could continue like this, the Royals would love to get a complete game from him. As of a couple of hours before the game, Joaquim Soria was not believed to be available after pitching the last two in Minnesota. It was a good start getting Carlos Quinton on two pitches. An inning and two thirds for Joaquim on Saturday and then got the save yesterday afternoon. Well, Trey really wasn't sure. I think he said in his meeting earlier in the, in the day, he said he was going to talk to him and, and see how he felt. And if he convinces him that he can go, he'll probably go with him. If not, he sort of was leaning toward Cruz in that situation. And now Jim Tomey, who's flied to center and struck out swinging. And the Trey also felt that since the starters were going so deep in games, the bullpen may not be getting enough work to stay sharp. And that's why sometimes they come out they're a little erratic when they when they first hit the mound. One and one. Well, that's the good news, bad news, Frank. Royals bullpen has pitched the second fewest innings in the American League. They have thrown 69 innings so far. Only the Angels have thrown fewer. So the good news is your starters are obviously doing a good job in going deep. But the bad news is, like you said, they're not getting a lot of work. They're not getting a lot of work, but at the same time, that could be good also because it's a long season. The hot weather hasn't gotten here yet, and and it may be a, a case where they'd be stronger when they get in July and August. Zach reaches back for 96. That's his ninth strikeout. Two down in the seventh inning. But Zach is just wearing back and letting it go right here to Tommy. He definitely feels like he can beat him with his fastball and he continues to throw it. And that had a lot of run to it away from the bat. You better bring a bag full of K's or Z's tonight. And a 
again the slow curveball to jump ahead of Canerco. He's mixing it real well. I, I think that's what I noticed when he threw his first complete game was the fact that he was able to make that adjustment in the middle of the game and from you go through the lineup one time one way switch it up the next next time and and occasionally just go back been on the who the hitter is the same way. Better than half the hitters he has faced way better than half the hitters he's faced. He has been ahead 0 and 1 although tonight I don't think it matters. He could be behind 2 and 0. That's hit to deep center field. But Coco is there to make the catch. Second time that Canerco has flied out to deep center. Seven shutout innings for Zach Rinke. Over the Tigers. Indian Blue Jays tied up. Blue Jays winning three in a row after leaving Kansas City and still have the best record in the American League. David DeJesus is two for four. David Homer back in the third inning. Red Sox Yankees, that's the first visit to New Yankee Stadium. Boston out in front. Angels will be at the A's. And the Rangers at Seattle. Seattle continues to surprise in the West. Five games above 500. Two and a half game lead over the team they will face tonight, the Rangers. Knicks makes the play over near the dugout suite. Mark Tien is one for four. In college nights, that's an offer of a $7 ticket to a high school and college student with a valid student ID. It's every Wednesday. May the 6th is the next Inc. College Night. We're also going to have a happy hour here with concession specials and the outfield experience. So a great deal for high school and college kids. Come on out Wednesday, 1-800-6-ROYALS, royals.com. For tickets, or you can come to the stadium. Drop by uh, Kansas City, St. Joe, or Topeka Hy-Vee Food Store. Clayton Richard picked off Miguel Olivo in the sixth inning. And Jesus with a very short lead over there with one out in the seventh inning and Guillen at the plate. One to know. And as a base runner, you have a, 
a pitcher like Richards with a great move and you get on first base and you, you know you're not going so you get the maximum lead but you better off to get a shorter lead and go forward than to get a maximum lead and be going back when he's actually pitching to the plate. 2 and 0. Oh. Now in this situation the Jesus maybe take a big lead even though he's not going anywhere maybe try and distract Richard with Jose Guillen at the plate. Well that could work but his his, his thought process has got to be going right back to the base on the first move in that situation. But if you want to go first move and try to steal a base sometimes it's short it's better to shorten up and draw less attention to yourself. So everything that you do is going towards second base and not get out there and be thinking about going back while he's in the process of pitching. You see how David is taking that step back to first base as soon as his foot goes up. And I think that's a, a negative for a base runner right there. So first and second one out. Here's the Firestone in-game box score. And we'll give you a rundown of the Royals at the plate tonight. That's the second time that Jose Guillen has walked and puts two on one out with Billy Butler to the plate. Pitching coach Don Cooper is going to go out and talk to Richard. And Mitch Meyer is going to run for Jose Guillen. Zach Grinke needs to get just six more outs. And he has thrown 79 pitches. So he could go 12 innings tonight if he needed to. Billy Butler has done very well against his pitcher. Two out of three. Just got underneath it. Maybe tried to do a little too much with that pitch. The infield fly rule is called as Ramirez makes the play. They got in on him a little bit, and and that, that's a ball that Billy usually doesn't swing at that ball up and, and on the middle land. He's better when the ball is down when it's middle land, but he's also better when the ball is out over the plate uh, when he wants to go the other way. Our next broadcast in high definition is tomorrow. Kyle Davies will pitch for the Royals. Gavin Floyd for the White Sox. That should be a good pitching matchup. 7-10 first pitch. Royals live with Joel Goldberg and Jamie Quirk at 6-30. Brought to you by Time Warner Cable, where HD is free with digital cable. Mike Jacobs working on a perfect night. A single, a double, a walk. Right-hander Lance Broadway, who almost very appropriately a couple of years ago was traded to the Yankees. Cologne went the first five innings, gave up three runs, and now Clayton Richard working on his second inning. Panerko to the bag himself. Royals strand two. And we are on to the eighth inning. Royals three, White Sox nothing.
in right field after running for Jose Guillen in the bottom of the seventh inning. A.J. Pierzynski, who has one of the three Chicago hits, will lead off against Zach and lines a curveball off of Tian's glove. That was only the 80th pitch thrown tonight by Zach Greinke. This is a good look at it right here. He just opens up early, hands was late, and just slices the ball and usually goes back to, to, to the third baseman. Mark just barely just got the end of the glove on that one. Now ball one on Ramirez. Strikeout, ground out to third for Ramirez. Zach has struck out nine. That is one shy of his season high. He struck out ten twice and two shy of his career high. Remember in his last start in the very first inning, he lost that scoreless streak, or at least innings where he had not allowed an earned run at 43 but finished the game retiring 12 of the last 14 and now working on a new score to streak. Well that's true and he's, he's done an excellent job with his breaking balls and changing uh, the eye level with his fastball but Ramirez is off to a slow start mainly because he's in the pull mode and they're trying to get him to get, hit the ball more the other way. And now he just pokes one into center field and this is the first time all night the White Sox have had more than one base runner. The one thing Ramirez has is he has a lot of reach, and Zach throws this really tight slider that the White Sox hit has been missing all night, but he, he, he even got the sweet spot of the bat on that ball, and that ball is down and off, off the plate. I guess that would qualify as a good piece of hitting right there. Avoid the strikeout, put bat on ball, and see what happens. Grinky and Tian had a little visit in between third and the mound in case Podsednik lays down a bunt. Podsednik is two for two. I mentioned when he batted in the sixth inning that he has not seen this version of Zach Grinky. He wasn't with the White Sox when Zach beat the Sox on April the 8th. And Potsednik is 11 for 22 in his career against Grinky. That's a 500 batting average. One ball, one strike. Of course, when Potsednik was with the White Sox first time around, that was one of the worst teams for Zach. They really pushed him around. Chance for two. Out at second. Low throw. Butler handles it. Velas does a great job here of giving Casper a nice feed, but Alberto tried to rush it a little bit more because of Potsednik's speed, and he really did Billy a favor because he gave him he gave him a long hop and not that in-between hop. So now Pierzynski down at third base with two outs. Wilson Betamit is going to hit for. Lillibridge, who was 0 for 2 with a strikeout. Better meet a switch hitter. And this is not the kind of guy that you want to sit on the bench for seven innings, shake off the dust, <laughs> and dig in against. Well, they want to come off the bench and take that first swing and try to get loose <laughs> and hope they can be successful on the next two strikes. I 
don't know if there's a scenario tonight where you want to face Grinky. But I got to think this would be one of the worst case scenarios. He's feeling it. We showed you earlier that he gets stronger as the game goes along. One ball, two strikes. Well, that's one of those pitches you would say <laughs> just fell right off the table. I mean, this is just some deep depth down. No contest on that pitch right there. Zach Greinke with eight shutout innings, and for the third time this year, he has struck out ten. Well, Ryan, I tell you, when the, when the crowd was on their feet for that last strikeout in the eighth inning, I think that told the whole story tonight. I mean, they're they're in the Zach, and, and they, they just come out here just to see him pitch, and he's really giving the fans what they come out for tonight. Alberto Cayaspo is singled to extend his hitting streak to six games. From this side of the plate, he's hitting 500. Slicing it into right field where Nix is now playing as the White Sox have shifted around their defense. Nix going from third base to right field. Wilson Betamete. Who pinch hit for the center fielder Lillibridge takes over at third and Scott Podsednik who began the game in right field shifts over to center. Olivo went around according to first base umpire Jerry Crawford. Olivo one for three singled last time up. No balls, two strikes. Well, tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo, and the Royals are going to host a celebration with live music and dancing and concession specials tomorrow. Fiesta starts at 4.30 in the outfield experience before the 7-10 game with the White Sox. Olivo down on strikes. 1-800-6-ROYALS for tickets, royals.com. You can stop by the stadium box office or an area hy food store. So two down for Mike Avila, so for three so far.
Velas is struck out, grounded out, lined out. White Sox in the ninth inning at the top of the order. Zach Rinke has thrown only 91 pitches. One and two on Avilas. So Zach will be going for his third complete game and his second shutout. Still one and two. scored all three of the runs against Bartolo Colon. Jose Guillen scoring in the second inning on an air by Podsednik who is in right. Avilas up the middle. Backhanded by Getz. Safe at first. So the air leading to a run in the second inning. De Jesus a solo home run in the third and Billy Butler driving in a run with a single also in the third inning. Well, that's true. When you're struggling and trying to get your average going the right direction, this is a nice base hit to get at the end of, for your last at bat of the night. And that brings up Coco. 0 for 4. Charging in, gets crisp, and we go to the ninth inning. Zach Grinke going for another shutout. Three to nothing, Royals. The Kansas City Royals may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Corporation. Ryan LaFever, Frank White, Joel Goldberg, with producer Kevin Schenk, director Steve Kurtenbach, as Zach Grinke is three outs away from another shutout. Hiasmo, his best play of the night, one down. Everyone wants to be a part of a pitching performance like this. Well, it seems like everything that's going on on the field is, is, is bringing in more excitement from the fans, whether it's great pitches, great plays, and that was a great pitch and a great play at the same time. 
over 20,000 here tonight. A Monday night with school still in session. Many of them here to watch number 23. Jason Nix is 0 for 3 so far. 10 strikeouts. Zach has tied a season high. His career high is 11. Out of play. Half the fans are saying, let's go Royals. The other half are saying, let's go Grinky. Two and one. So now one strike away from tying a career high in strikeouts. Still throwing well. He's at 95 miles an hour. That pitch there. And 21,000 people here umpiring with their hearts. It looked good and sounded good. They wanted it. <laughs> Still three and two. White Sox with five hits, four singles, and a bad hop double. And now in. Three plus games with Chicago Royals pitchers have held the White Sox to four extra base hits. Busted bat up the left field line. And that is inside the line and now rolls away from the Jesus. Nix is going to hold it. Second base. Pitch that all the fans wanted for strike three was a 95 mile an hour fastball off the outside corner. And the fans were making the call. <laughs> and on the very next pitch, was a slaughter right off the end of the bat, right down the line. David really did a good job trying to cut this off. And luckily, this they would have been a double on that play anyway, so no, no, no harm, no foul. Drilled to left, De Jesus is there. Just three starts ago, he threw his first major league shutout. And now trying to do it for the second time in four starts. Knicks will move up to third base. The Royals don't care about him. It's 0 and 1 on Tomey, who's 0 for 3 with two strikeouts. himself on the left side. 